This story may be distressing to some viewers, so discretion is advised. This incident occurred during my high school years. I was part of a basketball club and developed a significant crush on a senior member. We grew close and often met privately. On a day off from school, he called, inviting me to his house. Excited, I asked for his address. Surprisingly, he was already outside my house, ready to take me there. Rushing outside, I saw a car with an unfamiliar man seated next to my crush. Despite my confusion, I got into the car. As we drove through the countryside, I wondered about our destination and plans. Suddenly, the car stopped. My crush announced he had something to do and would return soon, leaving me in the car with the stranger. Confused and trusting, I waited. Eventually, we arrived at a house that clearly wasn't my crush's. The nameplate outside was different. The man suggested we have a drink inside while waiting for my crush. Inside, the vibe was unsettling. Many of his friends were gathered, and I felt uneasy. As night fell, I repeatedly expressed my desire to return home, but my requests were ignored. Things escalated when I received a call from my mom and one of the men snatched my phone, making it clear I wasn't leaving. I feared they were connected to the Yakuza. Resigned to my fate, I was overwhelmed with a longing for my parents. That night, I overheard a conversation about selling me. They locked me in a room, and I prepared for the worst. A week later, I was abruptly taken to a car, anticipating a transfer to another group. However, Unexpectedly, I was dropped off at my house. The man's sudden change of heart remains a mystery. My mother, unaware of my ordeal, was furious over my week-long disappearance. I didn't disclose the truth, fearing repercussions and worry. It's been 10 years since. I returned to school, but my crush had vanished, likely fleeing town. The experience was harrowing, but I am fortunate to have moved past it and am now living a happy life. This happened last January. After taking a week off work following New Year's, mainly to avoid the crowds and enjoy some solitude, my plans were simple. Shop a bit and relax at my apartment. On the day of the incident, I returned home by 7 p.m settled in with some snacks, and started watching TV, occasionally dozing off due to the day's activities. Around 8.30 p.m., the PA system in my apartment buzzed, indicating someone at the building's entrance wanted to come in. I wasn't expecting visitors, so I was puzzled about who it could be. The buzzing persisted, prompting me to peek out the window. I saw a large man, likely in his mid-forties, whom I didn't recognize. Given that there were only three other residents in the complex, and he was unfamiliar, I chose not to respond and muted the PA system. I returned to my couch, gradually dozing off, and eventually went to bed around 10 p.m. Later that night, a loud thud outside my room jolted me awake. My heart raced as I listened intently, but all was quiet. Cautiously, I checked the living room and hallway, only to discover that my apartment door was wide open. A wave of fear engulfed me. Retreating to my room, I noticed a huge dent near the doorknob and quickly locked myself in, calling 911 from my closet. I feared the intruder was still inside, but the apartment remained eerily silent. The police arrived, but found no one. They speculated that the intruder had gained access by buzzing other residents until someone unwittingly let them in. It was unclear why my apartment was targeted. The dent on my bedroom door, likely the source of the thud, seemed to result from a single, forceful hit, more out of frustration than an attempt to break in. 
Years have passed since then, and I still reside in the same apartment without further incidents. The identity and motives of the intruder remain a mystery. This event happened years ago, when I was a new nurse in my 20s, working at an old folks' home. While working as a nurse at an old folks' home, I had an encounter with a resident, whom I'll call Bob. He was in his 70s, with several health issues, but seemed like a typical, content old man who mostly kept to himself. One day, it was just Bob and me, and I was administering his medication. I noticed him smiling at a photo album on his lap, making conversation, as I usually did with residents. I asked if he was reminiscing about something. Bob looked up and replied affirmatively when I inquired if he missed his family. Given that he never had visitors, he maintained his smile and said his friends were his family, but they were all gone now. As our conversation drew to a close, he invited me to look at his photo album. Agreeing out of courtesy, I was unprepared for what I saw. The album contained distressing images of naked women in apparent pain and humiliation. They were bound, gagged, and posed in degrading ways. The fear and suffering in their eyes were haunting. Particularly, one woman who seemed to be pleading for help directly through the photo. Feeling sick and disturbed, I struggled to maintain my composure. Bob, watching for my reaction, casually explained that he used to be part of a biker gang. He referred to the women as stock they could use at will. Despite my urge to confront him, I sensed any outburst would gratify him, so I left the room silently, still in shock. After completing my other duties, I reported the incident to my superiors. However, when they searched Bob's room the next morning, the album was nowhere to be found. Bob had likely hidden it, anticipating my report. Despite this, he remained unchanged in his behavior towards me, but I couldn't help but feel reserved and disturbed. The incident has stayed with me, haunting me with questions about the fate of those women. Were they missing? Were they still alive? The possibility of Bob being involved in kidnapping or abuse as I'd heard in stories about gang members, left me deeply troubled. It's a messed up world we live in, and I try not to dwell too much on such memories. However, they occasionally resurface, like the incident with Bob. I often wonder why he chose to show me those photos. Did he want to relive his past, thinking it would be amusing to see my reaction? What if I had reacted differently, say, by shouting at him. These are questions I'll never have answers to, and I can't fathom how someone can be so twisted and depraved. At the end of the day, all I can do is hope that the women in those photos have found peace. Moving to a different time in my life, I was a senior in high school about 10 years ago. I grew up as somewhat of an outcast, not bullied, but without many friends. I embraced my solitude immersing myself in video games as an escape. My home life was stable, just my dad and me. He worked tirelessly after my mom, who got involved with the wrong crowd and substances, left our lives. It was a difficult decision, but my dad moved us away for a better life. He tried helping her over the years, but she eventually disappeared from our lives. During my senior year, my dad would leave for work once a month over the weekend, trusting me to be home alone. These weekends were a treat, with pizza and soda, a rare indulgence in our household. One such weekend, after enjoying my pizza and soda, I settled into my usual routine of playing PlayStation. I alternated between Call of Duty and the newly released Grand Theft Auto Online. Late into the night, I switched to GTA's single-player mode, seeking a change from online gaming. Taking off my headphones, which I find uncomfortable after long periods, 
I began to hear faint noises from downstairs, small vibrations and bumps. Being used to being home alone, these sounds didn't alarm me initially, but they were persistent and unusual. It was after 1 a.m., and I couldn't shake the feeling of unease that comes with being alone at such an hour. I paused my game periodically, trying to discern the source of these noises. They were mostly silent, with the occasional bump. When you're alone, even the smallest sound can be unsettling. Embarrassingly, at one point, I even considered the possibility of ghosts causing the noises. After debating with myself for about half an hour, I paused my game and sat in my computer chair, focusing solely on listening. The sounds, initially dismissed as house noises or cracking pipes, were becoming more frequent and consistent. It felt almost like my dad was downstairs, but the absence of his voice made me question that thought. Was I being overly paranoid? Or was there actually someone in the house? With my imagination running wild, I decided to investigate downstairs to reassure myself. Creeping down the hallway and approaching the staircase, the muffled sounds grew louder, heightening my anxiety. The thought of calling the police crossed my mind, but I hesitated, worried about the possibility of a false alarm. Reaching the bottom of the stairs, I noticed the kitchen light was on, casting a glow on the dark walls. I was pretty sure I had turned it off earlier, moving cautiously towards the kitchen. The sounds of someone rummaging through cabinets and a soft humming became audible. Expecting a burglar, I was taken aback when the voice sounded gentle, not threatening. Peering around the corner, I saw a small woman with wildly unkempt hair, singing softly to herself. My heart nearly stopped as I recognized her. It was my mother, singing a Disney song she used to sing to me as a child. Despite being frozen in shock and fear, a wave of recognition and nostalgia washed over me. She seemed to sense my presence and turned around, smiling broadly. However, the mother I remembered was gone. Her appearance was disheveled, her teeth rotten, and her eyes sunken. Her once soothing voice now sent chills down my spine. She approached me, saying, There's my baby. What are you doing awake at this hour? I couldn't. Feeling my mother's dirty hands on my shoulder, she commented on my father always changing out cabinets and laughed in a way that was neither charming nor calming. It was as if she wasn't really present in the moment. She turned back to the cabinets, humming and rummaging through them again. I snapped out of my trance, retreated to my room, locked the door, and immediately called the police and my dad. My dad, while ensuring I was safe, hinted that my mother might be dangerous. The police arrived, and I overheard a confrontation downstairs. My mother was yelling, claiming the house was hers. The police, informed by both my dad and me, managed to subdue her. An officer then called me downstairs, where I spoke with them, as another officer took my mother away. An officer stayed parked outside all night, providing a sense of security until my dad arrived. The revelation that my mother had two knives on her, including a sharp kitchen knife from our house, was deeply unsettling. The most chilling fact was that she had managed to find our new home, which was far from where we had lived before. She had broken in by shattering a downstairs window, likely when I was still wearing my headphones. It's been about 10 years since that night, my mother is now in an institution and has little memory of her past, including that night. Hearing those Disney songs still triggers a chilling memory, but I hope to eventually remember my mom in a better light. Now, shifting to a different experience, 
I used to have a weekly overnight babysitting job. The couple I worked for frequently spent nights in another city, and their eight-year-old child was pretty independent. My job was straightforward. Play with the kid, get him to bed, then relax. However, the house, modern and situated in the countryside with large open windows and no curtains, always made me uneasy. One night, while watching TV, I heard a tapping noise. Initially dismissing it as something outside, the sound persisted every time I raised the TV volume. Finally, turning off the TV and allowing my eyes to adjust to the darkness, I noticed a man outside the window, pressing his fingernail against the glass. The man outside made a continuous tap, tap, tap noise while smiling at me. Panicked, I rushed upstairs to check on the kid, realizing there was no phone upstairs. I had to stealthily return downstairs to call the police, trying not to look at the window, but unable to resist. I saw he was still there, watching me with an unsettling calmness. I locked myself and the child in his bedroom and waited anxiously for the police. When they arrived, they found no evidence of anyone around the house. I suspect they thought I was exaggerating, but I know what I saw. A grown man enjoying the fear he instilled in me that night. Switching to another experience. I'm an 18-year-old guy living with my mom in a neighborhood close to my extended family and the Gulf of Mexico, surrounded by chemical plants. The area is generally safe and friendly, with most residents valuing hard work and integrity. However, like any place, it has its darker aspects. Recently, a woman was found murdered in a storage unit by her husband, who later committed suicide. Another local, a former co-worker at the power plant where I work, was arrested for a hit and run. Despite these incidents, I've always felt secure here. One typical Thursday, after a regular day of work, I spent the evening at home, showering, playing video games, smoking a little weed, and having dinner. My mom's friend April, who lives nearby, visited us. When she was ready to leave around 9 p.m., my mom walked her home, saying it would only take a few minutes. Shortly after they left, I heard a faint tapping on my window. Initially, I dismissed it as paranoia and turned on some music to distract myself. However, when I thought I heard the back door open, I turned off the music and listened intently. Our back door is loud and distinctive, especially with a spare key left in the lock that jingles upon opening. I didn't hear any other sounds, but I was certain someone had entered the house. Feeling a mix of fear and urgency, I reminded myself to stay calm and grabbed the knife from my desk drawer, though I felt a bit foolish, considering it might be just my imagination. I knew it was better to be safe than sorry. Once again, the house fell silent. I decided to act confidently, hoping to intimidate whoever might be inside. With the knife in hand, I stood up and stepped out of my bedroom. For some reason, I whistled a single note. Approaching the corner where the back door was visible, I paused and whistled again, feeling a false sense of bravado. As I was about to turn the corner, a chilling response came. Someone inside my house whistled back, echoing from the living room. Terrified, I cautiously peered around the corner but saw no one. The door was closed but unlocked, and I couldn't recall if I had left it that way. My mom returned home shortly after, and I didn't mention the incident, finding it too strange and incomprehensible. I still don't fully understand what happened that night, but I'm certain someone responded to my whistle. Despite searching, I found no evidence of an intruder's presence. 
Shifting to another chapter in my life, about five years ago, my husband Adam and I began looking to buy a house. We were attracted to the charm and character of old fixer-uppers, enjoying the idea of restoring a rundown place into something beautiful. Growing up in a rural farming town in Indiana, I knew the area had many such houses, especially with the recent development of new factories and subdivisions. One summer Sunday afternoon, Adam and I decided to explore the back roads of my hometown to check out potential properties. Turning off the main road onto a secluded country lane, we noticed an abandoned house, almost hidden by tall grass, sticker bushes, and a massive tree, painted a deep green. It blended into its surroundings, looking at least a hundred years old and long neglected. The house, weather worn and in dire need of love, seemed perfect to us in that moment. With no neighboring houses in sight and just woods across the street, we thought a little trespassing wouldn't hurt. I justified our decision by believing we were genuinely interested in purchasing the property and not intending any harm. We thought we were doing a favor by considering taking this burden of a house off someone's hands. With no no trespassing signs in sight, our curiosity overcame us and we approached the side entrance, a mudroom with a half-open wooden door behind a closed screen door. The stifling heat inside was overwhelming, filled with thick humidity. The mudroom turned out to be a small pantry or canning kitchen, complete with an old rusted sink, a stove, and shelves of spoiled vegetables. Despite the initial excitement about the prospect of canning and gardening, my enthusiasm waned as we moved further into the house. Entering the main part of the house, we found ourselves in a kitchen with damaged cabinets and a sink clinging to the wall. It opened into a living area, starkly contrasting with the rest of the house due to signs of a past fire. The walls were streaked with black, leading up to a sunken gray ceiling. The windows were covered in dust and ash, rendering the room unnaturally dark for midday. My heart sank at the thought of the extensive and costly repairs a fire-damaged house would need. The living area was devoid of furniture, except for a small wooden rocking horse. Magazines were scattered all over the floor, as if someone had tossed them in the air randomly. Curiosity got the better of me, and I started to examine the magazines. Strangely, almost all of them were related to dolls. Porcelain doll collecting, Barbie dolls, making dolls by hand, and doll clothing. The sheer number of them and their specific theme added an eerie feeling to the already unsettling atmosphere of the house. Feeling increasingly unnerved by the doll-related magazines and the stark contrast between the pantry and the fire-damaged living area. I started to second-guess our decision to explore the house. The mix of the house's neglected condition and its hidden peculiarities made me wonder about its history. 